Mars Healing. Hello. With their presentation entitled, Challenges with Implementing a Drinking Water Management Program. Steve is a consultant with over 20 years experience and he is presently the Project Director and Training Specialist at Interface International. Mark is an occupational hygienist with over 12 years experience uh, predominantly in the mining and resources industry. So please welcome uh, Mark and Steve with their presentation, Challenges of Implementing a Drinking Water Management Program. I'll do a self-introduction uh, similar to the way that Kirsty did it, so I'll take your lead, Kirsty. So we've got the work stuff there, but the thing that really drives me is, uh, so I've got three kids and I've got a, a young son, so he's six years old. And he loves showing me these games that he's playing on his iPad, right? And he said, Daddy, Daddy, you come play this with me. So I play it with him and he absolutely smashes me, right? So he's like level 30 or something like that. So now my new favourite thing is to stay up all night, get up to level 40, and then in the morning I can beat him. So that's what I'm all about. Uh, it's good. Um, so I think some of my favourite bingo ones for myself personally is that um, I play the ukulele and I am currently wearing contacts. Um, <laughs> I stepped on my glasses this morning, so it was a last resort. I can't remember what else I had on there, so that was really the only two that I contributed to the group, but I still won. <laughs> so that was good. Alrighty, excellent. Um, so this, we've got obviously a presentation here, we'll go through it. Now there's quite a few different themes that we're going to touch on. So um, if you guys want to jump in at any time for any questions, we will have some like a more formal Q&A at the end. Um, but look, definitely interested in hearing from anyone if they've got anything they wanted to contribute to the group. So I guess the first place we want to start is we've got to understand that water management, so drinking water quality management, is actually a journey. So it's not something that just happens overnight or as soon as you write the plan and press submit, you're now managing your water quality. Right, so we've mapped out what we believe the journey looks like. So first of all, it starts off with the gap analysis or understanding that you actually need to do one. So that's the first one. Um, undertake the risk assessment, which is the underpinning for the actual um, management program. So I'm assuming that a lot of the sites that you're working on or, or partnering with already have management plans in place as per um, government requirements. So I'm assuming that we might be sort of somewhere here where the challenge that we wrote about in the plan, now we need to actually implement them. And <coughs> what we're finding is that there's sometimes a lot of noise, so usually the squeaky wheel gets the oil, and that doesn't necessarily uh, link back into the actual risk profile of what's being addressed. So, um, so this is the probably the hard bit, and I guess hopefully what we're all trying to aim for is um, at the end we're in that nice zone of just continual improvement, right? Things are working well, we're working proactively, and now we're just tweaking it um, on an ongoing basis. So, oh, do you want the notes up? No, all good, ah, gonna have to wing it. Alrighty, so essentially um, for the um, drinking water quality management plan, um, we might be familiar that there's 12 elements to it. So have a look at those elements up there and because I reckon we do some of them actually really well, right? So I think commitment to drinking water, assessment of the drinking water system, and we're definitely good at doing our verification, and we're not too bad at management of incidents and emergencies, depending on how sort of you know, mature um, the systems are at your site. Um, probably the other elements might need some work on, on a lot of sites that we go to. Um, would that be a fair assessment? So this one here specifically, so preventative measures for drinking water quality management. So this is the one that focuses on things like critical control points. So making sure that your plants are being operated, you know exactly what you're looking for, and if things don't go the way they're meant to in that day, that it's being escalated up the chain and responded to in a very proactive and fast and efficient way, right? Yeah. Um, then you've got your supporting procedures, so work instructions for, for the guys so that they know, um, so for the team and what they specifically need to do and they've got the right parts and knowledge to be able to do what they need to do. So I probably suggesting that elements three, four, and probably seven might be the ones that we might need to work on a little bit more. Would that be a fair assessment? Any, anyone else offer 
Any other specific elements? Yeah, I'll take that as, a, as, I, as I'm sort of on track. So, um, and that's really going to be the, um, a little bit of a structure for today is for those ones there. And the reason why they're difficult, um, I'm surmising, is that um, it usually is outside of the control of your scope or your remit, right? So as occupational hygienists, we're, we're covering a lot of things. We've got many hats, right? But there's a certain point in that process where it needs to go over to typically, you know, like the site services or the utilities or the, or the operators to do their bit. And very often, there's a disconnect or not speaking the right language in terms of priorities. So, where did you, did you oh, there we go. All right, this is my last one. Right, so what I always like to do is start off with, um, well, what, why do we even bother? What are our drivers for managing water quality? So, and again, let me know if you either agree or disagree or have any others that you want to chuck in here. But, um, I think it's fair to say protection of public health, that's, that's what we're driven by, that's what's important to keep people safe on site, um, plus that also links into our actual obligations and the duty of care as well. So that's usually the primary driver, but curiously, sometimes it depends who you talk to as to what their driver may be. So if you're talking to a production superintendent, yes, yes, we know that that's important, but really, I'm driven about making sure that my operation doesn't go down. Right, so if I have water quality that, so you know, we kept some results back, well, geez, guys, you might have a bit of faecal contamination in your water. We're going to have to shut down. We're going to have to do all of these things. That's sort of the language that sometimes other people speak. Um, then if you're more on the, on the side of um, dealing with, with people and managing people, consumer satisfaction and confidence can be a very big thing well so um, we've had many instances of, of union action and strikes over water quality at an incident which then leads into disruption to continuity of operations so that would be a driver um, and then if you're more on an asset management end maintenance considerations so um, water quality unfortunately there's no recipe for the perfect water quality it's always um, compromise of being sort of too soft or too hard and, and what uh, impact that has on your actual assets and infrastructure itself. And lastly, I would present that um, about brand for your firms. So more so with the larger organisations. So if you, um, you know, if your organisation has recently been in the media over something like, I accidentally blew up a cave or something like that, um, they don't want to be in the media for something else as well. So I think all of these come together um, really show a really strong reason of why managing water quality is important. I got another one. Hey, look, it's good you got cheap, huh? <laughs> all right, so this is, um, this is my last one before I hand over to Mark for a bit. So we reckon the reason why it's so difficult sometimes to get through there is I think there's actually ambiguity as to who the risk owner is, because it doesn't really neatly fit in anyone's role. So um, I'm sure they try it right every every other day, right? That it's the hygienist's responsibility for all water quality management across all of the site. Yeah, yep. sounds sounds about right. Um, or even the enviros, right? Because well, sometimes they take the samples, so therefore it's their responsibility to sample it, test it, respond to it, remediate it, and report on it. That's a good handball if you can if you can manage that. Um, what we found in situations where it's actually right, you know, no kidding around, people are actually getting hurt, is you start to realise that it is ultimately the GMs or the executives or whoever it is is responsibility. And yes, they may have delegated that to other roles, but do they know about that? Is that written in their role? So and hugely, it's actually split well. So site services or facilities management or whoever they are on your site, they've got a very important place part to play. But so too do the hygienists as well, if it's written in that way. You may also have contractors coming on site, right? So they might be managing your cooling towers and dosing it um, or doing remedial works or um, uh, scheduled maintenance. So it's really a combination of all of these and it's only when there's an incident 
when it's usually it's not my responsibility, right? That's pretty much what we see all the time, is that it really boils down to us. So we've been involved in a few incidents recently, um, and I was actually, uh, so EcoSafe have uh, recently been put on a WA government incident uh, management team. And um, that's really, it showed what this process actually looks like when, when it matters. And um, we'll share hopefully some of the lessons learned from that, but hopefully you can apply it at your, um, your sites as well. Cool, thanks Steve. So I think in line with um, what the challenges are with getting endorsement from a, um, I guess, more operational and site level, um, if we start with the documents that you know you bring out, you see once a year, skim over it, change the date, make a few changes, and then it goes back under the rug, and then next year you get told to review it again. So that documentation, I mean, that's essentially um, what, as Steve was mentioning, the GMs, the RMs, um, they're accepting that level of risk, and that's something that they need to understand in those documents. So as much as a 60 to 80 page um, document probably has uh, spelt out all the bells and whistles of, of a water quality management plan. If we can't extract um, the main roles, responsibilities and actual control measures, um, that, that may just get lost on, on deaf ears. So um, with the uh, health hygiene management plans, that's been a bit of a pathway for managers to really um, own their risks. So again, you know, you need their endorsement, they need to submit it. Um, so it's making them a lot more accountable um, to, to what they say they're doing on site. Document management systems, I've seen a few where sites will be comfortable um, just living in the red. You know, that document's three years old, that document's five years old. And there's not really um, that eagerness or, or push to actually then get that going. And I think it all comes back down to who actually is driving um, the controls, who's actually owning the risk and who's being held accountable. Um, work management systems. So I think what we say we do, what we are doing um, and what we're meant to be doing, um, that all ties in with how we're capturing it in those, those systems. So how are those maintenance schedules coming out? How are the hygienists knowing um, what to do, when to do it, and then what to do when it doesn't go right? So as well as, um, I guess, the key points of, of what we want in terms of a, a really positive level of endorsement is um, that clear custodian. So whether it's a, a registered, mine manager, registered mine manager, plant manager, uh, hospital exec, lab laboratories, Having a clear custodian um, will allow that uh, driver and motivation to, to actually um, have a succinct uh, management plan. So sufficient resources is always gonna come up. I don't think there's gonna be any um, health hygiene hazard that we discuss in this room where you know, your resources and um, budget allocations won't be an issue. Um, so that's definitely got to be um, accounted for and we'll go into that a little bit more when we come to the risk assessment um, stage. So the challenges of actually having the right people chair and be the executive sponsor um, of, of these types of, whether it's your um, committees, uh, plan reviews, uh, there will be a lot of uh, competing interests for those resources that we mentioned, so the budget allocations. So where you've got to can, you know, without bias um, and looking at it through a very risk-based lens, um, that person can be a real champion for, for your water management journey. Um, and as they will further go into, sometimes the only way to get uh, th that support and those resources is unfortunately when things do go wrong. There's an interesting term you've got up there. So a water quality coordinator. Anyone heard of that one before? Anyone in here one? <laughs> well, well you all, all are <laughs> right by, um, just by default. Because you're the, uh, so it's usually, yeah, um, it was like, um, that the radiation, uh, you know, the last person in the room to move, you, you, that, you, that's your role. So um, water quality coordinator is usually a role given to um, an existing role. So whether that be a hygienist or a plumber or a site services superintendent, it's not something that's usually thought out or well-defined. So I guess that leads into what is it that we probably do or don't do as um, hygienists? So. I feel like with 
um, the regular interaction we have with regulators, you know, you become that catalyst for helping your management team understand what their duty of care is. I think probably the main term with any of the management plans that I've sort of looked at at different sites is, Marg, tell me who wants me to do this? Do I need to do it? And how do I do this easily? So it's really about giving the workplace confidence that yes, we are recognising who we are liable to um, and that duty of care piece eventually will yeah, span across um, all the different regulators for your facilities. Um, so meeting the requirements of the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines, uh, there was those 12 framework elements. Uh, it's easy to put that into management plans, but to say that you're actually um, enacting on them and actually meeting each of those requirements, it really does become a full-time um, role. And the scope of most of you in the room here is that that isn't realistic. Um, so hygienist is there to provide clarity and facilitate uh, meaningful discussions. So when we go and talk about our 95th percentiles and our UCLs and SEGs, you wonder how meaningful that is, but generally water is a lot more visible. Um, there's a lot more customer complaints. It's, a, it's more of a, a physical um, and you know, in your face type hazard. So you do need to be able to um, yeah, facilitate, I guess, the, um, what, what you're likely to be able to do, which um, as Steve mentioned, unless you go out there with a wrench yourself, there's very few yeah, issues that we'll be able to do. Um, hands on ourself. So with the tangible risk reduction outcomes, um, that'll all tie back into your critical control processes and then that will tie um, back into the, the multi, I guess, facilitated levels of risk assessment. So I guess, is there anything on there that kind of stands out to you that you really do agree with or disagree with in terms of what your role in a water management journey would look like? Sort of pretty straightforward <laughs> all righty cheers that mark so uh, let's not just talk about all of the issues let's see um, hopefully we can get some potential solutions there so we've um, we've identified that recommendations are improvements so right you might have done a risk register um, you've got some improvements or recommendations from some sort of report okay so they are obviously going to have either an opex or capex um, implication more often than not. Um, sometimes, and actually we find this actually more often than we thought, it's actually unclear. So the recipients of the actual recommendation report, um, you know, it's very clear in the consultant's mind exactly what needs to be done, but translating that to an actual, you know, a note to be raised in SAP of the actual parts that need to be purchased and, and installed by whom in this way, that's usually where we start getting, um, you know, some spanners in the works. Um, and the other one is also the action owner just doesn't simply have sufficient authority to make the calls because of the amount of stakeholders that are involved when it comes to water quality management on site. Unless, again, you go back to that previous one of having that, that GM or executive sponsor, we can talk about a lot of things, but unless it's actually endorsed as, yep, actually, you're right, this is, this is important, this is business critical, this is a, um, a material risk from a safety point of view, you know, your, your company might, uh, might do that, is um, we need to overcome those hurdles before we actually get meaningful action is what we've found. So the potential solutions, so again, this is based on experience, so this is a, a partner, right? Um, we've, done, we've done the works, right? Absolutely beautiful documentation, right? You can have it audited by anyone, it will tick all of the boxes. Reality is, they had an incident. The incident was a result of risks that were identified in the risk register. It had a resultant risk and the recommendations to improve that, and they weren't acted upon. Even though the residual risk was, you know, either high or critical, and you know, you're usually told, ah, oh, look, we don't have time, we don't have budget for that. I can tell you right now that the time and budget um, restrictions were immediately lifted in the height of an incident. Uh, we were told that we had unlimited resources and do whatever is required to fix this. That sounds about right, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what I think, so in hindsight, what would have got us to a better balance? And it's actually the implementation plans. So 
or what we're calling the implementation plan. So we've got our, um, our improvement registers, which might be a consolidated list of uh, gap analyses, reports, and the risk register that we have. We need to get the actual stakeholders in a common room, in a workshop, right, two-way communication going on. Um, start going through, now probably the issue is, is that there might be 113 recommendations, right? Well, let's start easy. Let's get rid of all of the low and medium residual risk. Let's just park them for now, right? Let's just have a look at those high and very highs and start running through those. And um, we'll have a look. yeah, there might be a few that are in there that are low-hanging fruit, right? They're cheap, pretty quick to implement. Start getting some runs on the board, right? So even though it might not be your highest risk, just show that the, um, the actual team coming together can actually make positive change in terms of water quality management. So what an implementation plan actually is, is the process of going through all of those recommendations, allocating or agreeing which ones will be acted upon, say, in the next three to six months, or it might be 12 months or in the ne next budget cycle. Just have it documented there and endorsed. And if you're not doing it, hey, that's okay as well. Just put down your rationale and document it as well as to, yep, we recognise that that's important, but we're just going to have to park that for now. So at least it's all, it's all written out there. Um, the other one that was quite interesting is that this particular committee, um, there was a lot of wheel spinning going on until actually an independent third party came in. Um, so the subject matter expert came into the water quality management team with the executives and the plumbers and and the operators and all those sorts of things and just made it all simple, right? So we just say, right, yep, we recognise that these are all okay, but these are the top three things that we need to work on that's going to get this back to a safe situation. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a, a lesson learned. Hopefully that's of value. Um, so these are the sorts of things that uh, really start getting the wheels turning. So we've got situations where you might have some of your colleagues in you know, new, in the media um, trying to defend the way that we manage things. Or um, well this example from overseas is where they actually had to shut down the hospital. I realise that these are healthcare examples, but I'm sure you get the point in terms of um, when you make it um, into the media, you know you've got, you've got an issue. Um, minerals and resources, they tend to fly under the radar a little bit, but um, we are certainly aware of many situations, very serious situations that, that do come about. So this was a, I oh know it's not very flat. Um, I do this very, very quickly. Um, one of the things we were trying to do for, um, for one of our partners was, hey, I really want to move this along. Um, Steve, where does my facility sit in terms of all, all the sites that you deal with? If you were to peg us in the spectrum, where are we in terms of water quality management? Because you never really want to be right at that end of the curve. You sort of might have some comfort being in the middle and you know the you really want to be here. We can have a competition as to who can get more, but um, this is just in terms of maturity of the systems, um, the implementation of what we say we are doing to manage risk is um, sometimes benchmarking can actually really help. This was really helpful. I think I've got something coming up shortly in terms of when you've got multiple sites or facilities that you're dealing with. Sometimes you really need to understand well what's the respective risk profiles of each site. And then you may have a massive outlier, so that if you had a, a, a finite amount of resources, you put it into the one that needs it the most. So benchmarking and heat mapping is a very good tool for that. So here's, a, here's an interesting one, maybe a little bit uncomfortable. But um, so I'm going to get you to ask yourself, in the event that harm is caused um, by unacceptable water quality on site, what's actually, uh, what are you most comfortable with? being not aware of that specific risk, and it's like, oh geez, I never, never thought that that could actually cross connect to that and poison this person. Or that you have actually had that risk assessment, it is documented, but you just haven't had a chance or you haven't acted upon those recommendations. So sometimes, look, I mean obviously we don't want any, any, um, any pressure on the, um, on the decision makers, but maybe you need to ask this question to them as well terms of, hey, we have been told of all of these issues. I think that's probably a wee bit worse that somebody gets hurt and we haven't acted. So it's, yeah, it's a little bit of an uncomfortable one, but I thought I'd, I'd bring it out. Cool. 
at you. So following on from uh, the endorsement of the execution, the second challenge that we'll typically see on site is that prioritization piece. So you've got your risk assessments done, you've got your management plans, everything's looking good. You've got your list of you know, 80 to 130 line items that you, you then now have to sift through. So when we're looking at um, the implementation plan, the main things to consider is always about how feasible and realistic it will be. Um, each company will have its own way of obviously prioritizing and risk assessing, whether it's um, number of personnel exposed, number of uh, population served, or sort of what the last sort of 12 month trend has been in terms of you know how, how confident are we that um, this little pocket here is compliant and where can we focus those controls. So I have a couple of examples there of how we've presented um, that prioritization um, in a few different settings. So with uh, it was the is it reusable devices? Yeah, reusable yep. medical devices. Yep. Um, so AS4187 uh, has three very clear steps around how they um, enact on the prioritization. So uh, they've got completion of a gap, as gap analysis, uh, development of that implementation plan, and water monitoring requirements. And those three steps are undertaken um, every single time at every single healthcare facility. If I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, so it's actually, this actually comes from a licensing body. So I realise that this is healthcare and it's not what we deal with. But um, what I identified is that it was a, a really eloquent way of actually dealing with something that had been not managed well for a very long period of time. Is that they were having a look at results from all of these things and they were very, very commonly not complying with the standard. And there was huge variation across facilities. So they actually went at it with a big regulator stick and they just said, right, enough's enough. You've got till June 2021 do a gap analysis to find out exactly where you sit. But then you've got until the end of the year to come up with an endorsed implementation plan, right? And this is pretty much where we nick the, the process from. And, um, and then you've got another year to actually implement what you've agreed to in the implementation plan. So I thought it was quite a, quite a good process. And again, it shows you that, look, you don't need to fix everything immediately but you absolutely need to have a very clear, documented, and endorsed plan. That's a good place to be. Yeah, so that ties into that word just there around a defensible plan. So of those 80 um, controls that are presented, using something as simple as a traffic light system, or obviously you know, a, a risk matrix uh, would then help to prioritize those. So you can easily then document that you have rejected 30 um, based on the feasible um, and realistic nature of them. These five we can probably complete within the next three months realistically. Uh, and then from there, you can, once applying your actual risk rankings or traffic light system, actually make that into a, um, a bit more of a workable implementation plan. And it, it is helpful to then start to split out and have a look at you know which key stakeholders you do need to engage typically with those plans you know each department will get you know the whole the whole list and it's not clear then you know what they're they're focusing on so really tailoring that to who owns the risk who's going to be carrying out the risk mitigation um, and then who's then collecting the, the information afterwards <laughs> Let's do a ring in and go, we need to think about the things so that we can't just get rid of the idea and then have a snap and say, um, it's no one's fault in there, but it's bogged down. Or our public health officials need to call them and say, we, we've got this problem, we can't get there, can you go and have a look? This is wonderful, but if, if it's from staff, So do you guys have the, we'll call it an emergency, but 
Yeah, it's actually critical okay. controls. It's on the next, next slide. Next, next. Yeah. So essentially, um, what you're talking about in, in, in the industry, there's um, it's commonly referred to as trigger action response plans or incident response protocols. So, um, so for example, we've got 17 examples of, as you say, when you've actually got the start of a potential incident, exactly who is doing what. Um, the short answer is yes, that is something that we have. And we do, if we're working with any of our partners, we strongly advise that they have those. That's one of the key recommendations of managing water quality, which is element six, five. Four, six. three. Six, <laughs> six, you can test me. So does, that, does that help? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I suppose I would just, I only ever think of earthquakes and tsunamis. Yeah. So that's my thing. Um, <laughs> and I see the plans that you're giving as well and go, yeah, that looks like it might be a case that happens in this. Is, is there a time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and these would essentially, and it's great that you bring that up, these are the really tangible things that make a massive difference the 70 recommendations, and one of them is to develop your incident response programs, which it typically is, that would be one of the ones that typically are, hey, let's get these, because these are the ones that make a massive difference to managing things on site. Whereas you've got other ones, which is, uh, you know, you should label your tank in accordance with AS3500. Okay, I'll do that later. So this is, this is a common challenge uh, across essentially all of our partners, both mining and healthcare, is that there's a massive, massive focus on laboratory sampling and responding to things that aren't quite right when, when there's an issue. Um, as we mature through, through the thing, it should really, that shift should sh fundamentally change over to leading indicators, not those lagging indicators. So we need to be looking at, hey, how's my water treatment plant running? 24-7 in terms of the critical parameters, so whether that be um, electrical conductivity for RO membrane performance or chlorine for our chlorination systems, all of those sorts of things are absolutely crucial. And that's when um, the hygienists, but if we want to have a robust proactive system, we'd be leaning and acting upon those leading indicators. That's really the challenge. Yeah. So I'll probably lead into a bit of um, the information around what those KPIs, leading lagging indicators might look like. Um, so Steve mentioned around benchmarking um, across an organization uh, as a whole, but you can obviously do these within your own work groups. So if you've got your similar exposure groups and you know that um, you do have uh, good maintenance programs, um, historical data, flushing routine, uh, flushing regimes and programs, and also capturing that operational data and the verification data, so whether it's your um, disinfection residuals, all of that can then uh, be applied in making a bit more of a prioritization at a, at a more granular level. So we obviously wanna prioritize large controls and how many people they'll impact. When you s start to have smaller hydraulic zones, say, or you've got tanks popping up all over the place um, and you wanna start to see you know, which, which areas need a little bit more of attention, that's just a simple visual way to show um, the leadership team that you know, you've, got, you've said you've got all these things in place um, for three months running, uh, we still haven't seen an improve, uh, improved um, level of compliance. So now let's, let's change our tact. So it's another, um, I guess, everyone's got metrics, matrix type um, things within leadership teams, but Steve mentioned the incident response protocols, which um, then actually lists out the roles and accountabilities as well. So with the roles and accountabilities and who's actually looking at the data and who is, actually monitoring the lead indicators. Um, I've just got an example here. So electroconductivity um, was completed. It looks to be monthly data. Yeah. And with a really well controlled, everyone understands their role. Um, the verification is being done correctly. The data is going in correctly. You see, is there a stop? 
I'm colorblind, so I actually can't see the dots. <laughs> but you'll find, so this is between 2019 and 2020. You've got two years of a really stable system where you're comfortable and confident that your electroconductivity is being measured and uh, put into the system properly. Once you start to see the ball drop, it's all over the place. And then you try and help it out. So you might get a subject matter expert in to do sampling for a period of time, and it helps for a period of time. So between July to the end of the year. And then once that contract ends, or once the work is considered to be done, then it all just drops off again. And if no one's looking at this, then you're not going to be actively you're not going to be actively looking for um, where to to then put your um, I guess maintenance priorities. So this is just an example of electroconductivity, but the other ones obviously important to your operational teams and what they would want to see is your free chlorine, um, any pressure, temperature, pH, any anything that will impact um, the the <coughs> operation of their RO plant or their um, dosing systems. Cool. Do I get my one back? Oh, okay. <laughs> You've gone with one. <laughs> Alrighty, so the one I just wanted to really quickly cover is, um, so in terms of challenges to implementing a drinking water program, so we might have results that are above the criteria um, in ADWG, um, or there's um, ADWG doesn't even have a criteria for it, and we've got something that's sort of looking maybe a little bit strange, um, or we don't really know how to interpret results. So um, we want to be solution um, first of all, we want to have full documentation as well, so we're bringing it to your water quality uh, management team. So uh, document any um, implementation issues and showing rationale, and it's really, again, it's always back to that risk base, right? Assessing the risk of that, because sometimes the issues are actually quite trivial. So um, doing that little bit of a sanity check on it, first of all. Um, ab absolutely, here we go, we've re-emphasized this point. Having your predetermined trigger action response plan. Um, but again, look, we're all in this forum. Um, it's interesting, we, we also presented at the Institute of Healthcare Engineers and um, you know, we're all having, they're all having similar challenges, but everyone was so prideful and you've also got confidentiality issues as well, right? Is that for us to work together to get the best outcome for the industry, sometimes we just need to talk to each other. Um, otherwise it's sort of like you know, going to the doctor and say, oh, um, a friend of mine has got a rash, what would he do about this? So we need to be able to speak in a safe way of how we've actually um, navigated issues and actually come up with a positive solution. So um, I'd love to say that, that here we go, look, I've, I've tailored it nicely. Seek out um, the, um, so you, you know, your members here as to what might be able to help you, subject matter expert, um, and we've even got the option there of a chief water officer. So their role would be to manage all water quality related things and manage by trend analysis as well. So if you've got a stable system and then something spikes, that really gets you going as well. Um, just as a quick example of sometimes where we might do a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, um, when it comes to ADWG and we've got those health-based trigger criteria, right? Is anybody, it's really fun if you haven't, who's looked into the actual um, following sheet where it actually gives you the derivation of how they came up with that magic number? Yes, I know, it's good fun, isn't it? So here's just a quick example, is they usually done some study, probably in the 70s when things were a little bit easier to experiment. Um, they determined the body weight depending on, on what it is, which they can may not be suitable to your site, um, how much they drink, uh, the average weight um, of, a, of an adult, which apparently is 70 kilos, so I don't know how that makes most of us. Um, and then I love this one here, right, times 10,000. So in this situation here, they've applied a 10,000 times safety factor for this particular one there. So if you get a, um, so if we're 0.02 and we get a, you know, a hit of 0.021, I don't think everyone's gonna immediately die. So um, what it means is that if you do go above that criteria, it does mean that something probably isn't quite right and does need to be looked into. So. Definitely share it with some of your colleagues to find out actually, hey, is this an acute, immediate health risk? Um, and then that will dictate. Cool, thank you. So I guess what do we want on site to make all of that easier? So trending, 
um, you know, making sure that we are capturing those out of spec results and making sure that those notifications are being completed in a timely manner. Um, Excel, go to Excel if all else fails, to be honest. But this was a simple macro um, that one of our graduates uh, pulled together where at a push of a button, if you get, you've got your ALS results, they'll go in um, and essentially if you've got your AWG criteria um, set in there with its parameters, it just then gives you that um, initial overview of, okay, where are my reds? Where am I complying? Where am I missing limits? So I guess however, however you are storing your data is going to impact greatly on you know, data in, data out. Um, but again, there are uh, examples where if we're, if we're even going to be using, um, I think we've got here, a lot of the digitalized um, data storage spaces. So working with um, the environmental team, you do find that you know, you'll have a system for groundwater. Um, drinking water will sit over here for a while. Um, so you are trying to navigate and, and bring information from um, a, number of, a number of areas. So what we do want to see is, I guess, when we are looking at um, our verification monitoring plans, is it representative? Are we you know, reporting them in the right zones, how many samples are we taking. Um, we want to be very, I guess, accurate in terms of our sample points as well. So definitely issues that I've uh, hoped that some of you might be able to uh, share stories later on is, I guess, sampling logistics. So being remote sites, limited flights, um, depending on who is taking the samples, public holidays, um, it becomes pretty difficult to get uh, samples to a, a lab within holding time in, in a lot of uh, situations. So as, as much as the technicians on site will power ahead, um, unfortunately there are some, some unforeseen circumstances, but it's about then, okay, well how do we report that? How do we capture the, the fact that if we miss these samples, it was due to a logistics run, um, and then making sure that we are documenting that and then rescheduling. So with scheduling, um, I guess some of the most effective ways to have the lab work for, for you is to make sure that um, they understand what your suites are and obviously um, you know, on your annual reviews, uh, making sure that if there are large um, suites such as your inorganics or CFM, yeah, that would probably be one of the, the larger ones, making sure it's risk-based to, to your site. If, if you're not expecting um, to have a contaminant pop up, um, it may not be I guess cost effective or time e um, efficient to, to continue sampling for that. So working with the lab is, is very important and building those relationships with um, the client liaison officers, the sample um, receipt officers, the sample bottle dispatch team, um, all of that makes a huge difference when it comes to the logistics. So I mentioned, um, I guess, in-house uh, solutions to generate the spreadsheets, but anything where you can actually automate your scheduling will make it a lot easier for the different um, team members who, who need to go to a particular area. If you think about that work management systems that we were um, talking about from a maintenance point of view, they rely on that. They won't go to a job unless it's categorized as you know, maintenance, breakdown, break in. So we have to think about that lingo and that style of scheduling for, for hygienists as well. So a snapshot, a bit of an example of a um, outlet, so it's got the date that it's scheduled and then um, a minimum and maximum tolerance where once it's outside of that maximum tolerance, a push report will come out to say that you've had missed tasks or tasks are overdue. So there are, there are ways that hopefully it makes um, that scheduling piece easier. Otherwise, I, I know that I've sort of scrolled through spreadsheets and it's like week one, week two, week three, um, so accuracy, that's, that's something that we're aiming for. Some of the uh, dashboards and the data out that we want to see um, once you've got your scheduling and uh, imports completed, they can range from um, whether it's microbiological compliance results, uh, repeated failures, I guess this will depend on what your leadership teams are considering their greatest risks and where they want to focus uh, their efforts. So if these aren't being used to trend um, across time and if they're not being used to show effectiveness, effect effectiveness of control, um, essentially they just become pretty posters again. So these really do need to be um, used, you know, whether it's 
board of committee meetings, um, but you've got to get the right stakeholders to be, to be looking at that information. Oh, my turn. Very good. Um, so another um, imp uh, implementation challenge that we've, uh, we commonly see is actually training and awareness requirements. So um, it's quite, so have a look in your plan to see actually how you address the whole training and awareness, which is one of the elements of the um, AUWD. So here's an example of an extract um, of a plan that we a plan that we did up, and we've sort of tried to break it down by role. So anyone that's actually dealing with maintenance of potable water should have some level of like you've got this whole appropriate drinking water quality awareness training because it's very difficult to just nail in on something specific. So um, whereas water samplers, um, if we go to sort of the national accreditation course and there's one called NWP, then 007 gives us sample and testing of drinking water, so that's a formal accreditation you can get. Um, or equivalent training course based out, um, so there is actually a requirement now in the new standard, so the one that got released, what are we now? Uh, so it was a month ago. Um, so the new AS5667.5, so the standard for drinking water, um, now actually dictates the training requirements for those people. Essentially what it says is they should have some level of understanding of microbial and chemistry, um, just fundamentals, because that's what they're doing. Um, whereas when you're at the pointy end of it, so people actually responsible for plant, for producing safe drinking water, what the, um, essentially, the National Water Utilities and organisations will say is you've got to have a cert tree and water off. Now, that is not easy to arrange. It's not something that's tomorrow yet, no worries, just jump on the course. Um, sometimes that can take you know, a year or actually quite difficult to, to implement. So what we might be able to do, so potential solutions, is is there an opportunity to build in a basic level of awareness into your company or your site induction? So hey, this is where we get our water from, this is how it's treated, and if you see any of you know these three things, it's really important that you you know you report that to your supervisor. You know, just that real basic stuff. Um, ideally, you'd have something built into your LMS. So, um, oh, it's telling me I'm, I'm way too late. Uh, we're almost finished. So in your LMS, so based on your role, it can actually allocate modules to um, to you so that you are, you know, being competent for those specific things. I might say goodbye. Goodbye. Hi. Um, so, well, what are you going to do in the interim as well? So sometimes short courses can be a really great way of ticking a box and doing a little bit of a bridge because you know we're always we're all dealing with staff turnover and those sorts of things. So um, you know, it might be an online type course, so we've got one here, it's like two hours to cover the key elements of, say, Legionella awareness, and then you've actually got you know, a certificate that you can put away. You've got some evidence that you've made an effort to, um, to uh, along the whole training um, and awareness sort of team. Cool. So one of the uh, final challenges that we face, and to be honest, um, as a hygienist, this is probably one that um, I face the most often, but it's also my favorite to, to tackle, to be honest, and that's around um, establishing that trust. And when things do go wrong, how do you build that trust back with the workforce? How do you continue to move forward on that water journey? So water quality can ov obviously be highly emotive. Um, it's quite easy to Google uh, any of you know, the health hygiene terms, and unfortunately it does spit out some, some quite, you know, emotive language um, in terms of the, the health effects. So um, it can be the driver for disgruntled staff, union action as um, Steve mentioned. And it's also difficult to communicate what is an acceptable risk. Um, so we do have to obviously take, take on board any of those complaints and um, I guess concerns that the workforce have. So potential solutions um, that we've seen work in the past is obviously that transparency of disclosing um, results and trends. So having that just as a simple traffic light system um, is probably as, as simple as you, you need to go. So if, if you've got a workshop, um, the workers understand that um, you know, there's sample points here, here and here, having a traffic light system to say, you know, in January, it's all green ticks it does quell to then, you know, not have those additional questions um, of, you know, why isn't that tested or when was that last tested? Having that readily available 
get in safety committee meetings is generally generally a good spot to put it. Safety advisors um, do tend to reach out to hygienists for, hey, do you have a topic for the month? So, you know, make water quality one of one of those metrics. Um, so, Steve mentioned just the general awareness in induction packages. Um, I've seen that work well with plant operators where they go around looking at the emergency safety showers. So, you know, they go, they do a flush, but they're not necessarily understanding, you know, what they're seeing is potentially, um, you know, iron corrosion in, in the pipework. They're just like, oh, it was always brown. Like, it's always brown, it's fine. Um, so really just giving them that awareness of uh, what their hazards are in their particular areas. Um, comparisons to situations that they actually understand and can relate to. Um, it's very difficult to have a workforce and you're talking about an event that's happened at a neurophysics facility in Norway. Um, so really understanding their tasks and any time we're talking about what we're sampling and why we're sampling it, um, what their routes of exposure are. So look, definitely concerned about, um, you know, an E. coli result in that particular area, but what's the actual likelihood that that's going to be your, your route of exposure? So that continuous that continuous awareness of um, what, they're, what they're at risk of. And show the improving trend. Um, a really helpful one uh, with, I guess, um, like commute handovers, like, okay, what happened last week? It is really good week on week, month on month, whatever um, particular workforces might be, but they do want to see that something's being done. And, you know, while they were away, no one's sitting there twiddling their thumbs. You know, they come in and they're like, okay, yep, that was green last week. Why are we amber? Why am I wearing, why am I having to wear a dust mask? Now I didn't have to last swing. They don't know that. Um, so having that information in, in something like a commute handover can be, can be actually quite valuable. Um, and show them what you do. I thought that was, uh, that was probably one of my favorite things. You know, you trot around, you've got your little bag and you've got your colorometer and they sort of look over you like you're doing a science experiment and just explain why you're there, what you're doing. Um, and it's very important that your team actually know why they're there and what they're doing because they will get the questions. It's like, is this safe to drink? And that's a very difficult question for, for someone who's potentially new to water sampling to, to answer as well. So communicate with your teams and make sure that that's, um, yeah, everyone's on the same page. Yeah, one for not establishing trust is, uh, yeah, the water's all fine and then you grab your bottled water and you drink from that. Yeah. It doesn't quite work. Um, alrighty, so last one, so key takeaways from today's little session. So um, understanding that our management plan and monitoring program is actually only part of our water management journey and what, we've, what we're probably focusing on now for all of us is really in that implementation part of it. And to help that, having a clear implementation plan with clear rationale and actual actions allocated to appropriate people is um, you know, a very effective way of doing that. Um, we've covered the risk-based decision-making side of things. And and acknowledge that the journey never ends, right? It's cyclical. So once you get to the end, then really it's just building in from those lessons learned and it's really just touching things up as you step around. Um, we've certainly found that endorsement and awareness are probably the two, the biggest catalysts to getting things moving. And um, yeah, and again, re-emphasizing, reach out to your, uh, your fellow colleagues here and get a good outcome. So I think that, that's it, unless you got anything else? Mm -mm. No. Right, that's us. Um, happy to take any questions. Yes. Thank you, um, Stephen. Uh, for the presentation. Just thinking, so there's a couple of weeks ago, a um, paper at the conference came out about changing the legislation for the Clean Water Infrastructure Fund for public health. Yep. So, if what, what, what's the status with that one? COVID. Sorry. COVID. COVID. Oh right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Ryan, do we have the latest update on that? It's still like another year and a bit away. Yeah, we haven't given, been given a hard date. So it's going to be the drinking water regulations. Um, so they are still planned for WA, um, but I think there's still a wee way a while. Yeah. Thank you for your participant. Um, you know, it's probably all the more reason to be proactive and get on the top of it. 100%. Yeah, we don't know what it looks like yet, but um, if we're involved in any of the public consultation, we're going to be very heavily um, pushing it towards the <coughs> proactive, um, so the leading indicators. Um, because that's how we're going to um, generally improve. Um, there are two questions. So the first one was, do you ever suggest what sort of management plan is to be either structured more carefully so that um, plans that are given one, where you hand 
So that, that is an awesome question. We've done it on at least three times that I'm aware of. All three of those, however, have been after an incident. So that's when the actual, um, the GMs or the RMs actually are interested and interested, yes. So um, in those examples there, effective communication of it, and as we say, focusing on those key risks, that actually led to very effective programs being implemented. And now they've got some extremely <coughs> comprehensive, so you know, on par or better than water corp, you know, utility level safety. Um, we do have at some of the mine sites, um, but unfortunately all of those have been after they've had to feel it, feel the pain. So, okay, so the example that you're talking about there was actually one of the parliamentary investigation findings of the Walkerton disaster in Canada. So one of the key findings of, this is um, Destiny 2000 in Canada, one of the key things is that they had an impact, they had a result in the lab, and the lab didn't tell people. And that was one of the, one of the core factors that led to multiple fatalities. So what we suggest now we have established is essentially a formal and signed memorandum of understanding with your laboratory supplier you say, right, if we get these pathogens in potable water, don't just send off an email to here, you actually need to make verbal two-way communication contact with the mean measure list of people. So that is part of the process that we would be recommending. Um, and that's really the lessons learned from previous incidents. Yeah, I think that because yeah. as a regulator and as someone in science. Um, and then the other issue is you seem to be Tell anyone. Yeah. Well, we've got, well, we're working on trying to get that out. Yeah. Um, you know, I, they call me the poo lady at NASA because, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, because you don't always have plumbers doing the connections and sometimes the connections go the wrong way. Absolutely. And when you've got, you know, the, the terminology of this water tastes like
bit quicker on that, we had two, two sites, side by side, same, same partner. Um, one of them, the contract builders identified that loophole and got in a cheaper bid so they did no backflow prevention or anything like that because they didn't need to. And they did actually have a situation like you described. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And Thank there's, there's ripples of this in the company world. So that's not new. Yeah, no worries at all. Okay. So, yeah, so essentially the, the fundamentals of, of water quality management and that, so the ADWG align very closely to the World Health, Health Organization and how they do it. Um, I mean, we've got an active project in Saudi Arabia and we're doing some other things. It's, it's the same framework, it's the same risk management, um, the principles still apply. It's just when you go to trigger criteria, sometimes you just need to um, adjust for the specific regulatory um, body that, that governs you. That's, um, that's part of their and also like credit the scope. Stuff that Mindy was uh, just mentioning there about the sort of the interim result. That gets very hairy in like a voluntary result. Like the, yeah, before you've got an official result to report something, you've got you can yeah you can yeah. You have to build those relationships, because, eh? Yeah, yeah, because basically, I mean, come from a NARPA perspective, you're now starting to go through the NARPA accreditation to report any result prior to the. Yeah, but the loophole is a is a phone call though. <laughs> yeah. But Call them the Russian roulette. Yeah, and I've seen in addition to the two interconnection problems that you know, that you don't need funding on site, I've seen Maramar, for example, when you visit that they interconnected their process water and their water water. Um, and that was found not from testing because now the testing for the chemical contaminants was only done every month, I think. But people were getting rashes in the showers from the interest flow. Yep, so I think that really ties into um, taking on board any of the customer complaints, whether it's taste, odour, um, a, a lot of them, you know, we'll talk about, yeah, hardness of water and, and rashes and whatnot, but I think if, uh, even, even for a small site, if we have a good understanding of where your, you know, operational control verification points are, so, you know, we know that, you know, this water is meant to come from over here, we know that this water is meant to come from over there, as you start to trend that, you will see, I guess, the, the anomalies pipe up, so, oh, okay, what happened this month? Oh, yeah, we had a shutdown, turn that valve, oh, did we turn it back on? And then, you can, yeah, it, it's really about getting the that leading yeah. indicators yeah. going. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have, uh, there's always someone who lives on a farm, drains rain That's the one. Uh, off the roof, <laughs> of the oh, of every the time. Every, always the farmer.
absolutely true, yeah. Um, we get that all the time. Steve uh, actually has a really good section in his training that's just about rainwater tanks and farms. Yeah, so I mean, the one that I present to them is I just, I just say, yeah, look, you know, yeah, absolutely, you're used to that. But then I, I try to link it back personally to them in terms of, hey, it's fine for you. But if you had like an elderly father or grandfather or someone that has, you know, slightly immunocompromised or you've got a newborn, it's a completely different risk yeah. exposure. So usually that sort of, oh, I hadn't thought of it like that. Um, there's been a few times where I've, uh, where I've tried to explain the risk to the paper guy or the superintendents or whatever, and then they're like, yeah, there's nothing going on. And I just say, well, have you had people uh, calling in rats? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's pretty often, actually. Blame it on the eggs. 